Well, folks, looks like we're just about ready to start. Um, everything all set with Zoom? Okay. Um, at the end of the uh, end of Don's lecture, we'll open it up to for question and answers for a little while. And uh, the only other little housekeeping thing we have to do this morning is just remember to either silence or turn off your devices so that it doesn't interfere with the talk today. Webster's, oh, by the way, I'm Lauren Mings. I'm the coordinator here today. And uh, Don Williams is a HAST member and is going to be speaking to us here shortly. Um, I'd just like to get started with just a few little little bits of uh, information here, and then, uh, then we'll talk a little bit about uh, Don's history. Uh, Webster defines talk as to put ideas into or exchange ideas by the spoken word. Defines communication as the successful, and that's important, successful, <laughs> conveying and exchanging of information or feelings. Um, in order to have good communication, you need two things. First, you need an articulate speaker, speaker who says what he means to say and, and uh, get the right uh, uh, meanings out. But you also have to have a receptive listener. And without both, all you have is talk. And that's been some of the problems that we, we have in society today. We do a lot of talking, but not a whole lot of listening. Um, two dates, March 28, 1979. Uh, a, a leak of, of some nuclear material or some radioactive uh, material is uh, noticed at the Three Mile Island um, power plant. No serious damage done, but uh, there was certainly raised the consciousness in the United States of nuclear reactors and nuclear energy. July 16, 1984, a press release. Midland Dow cancels a nuclear reactor, which had been 85% uh, completed at that time, with millions and millions of dollars being spent on that um, particular reactor. Those two uh, incidences were instrumental in changing the uh, direction of the nuclear energy program in this in this country. Um, at about the summer of uh, 2017 or 18, I guess I was I was talking to Don about nuclear energy, and he said, "You know, we have the uh, 40th anniversary of Three Mile Island coming up very shortly," and he said, uh, "Maybe Hass would like to hear a talk on." Um, Three Mile Island and the communication problems that occurred with Three Mile Island. And I said, yeah, that sounds like a pretty good idea. But before we could get it scheduled, we had some um, scheduling problems. And then we had COVID. And um, recently, our, our social sciences committee was meeting. And we were talking about communication and uh, the need for good communication in social industry. Need to speak a little closer? OK. Yeah need for good communications, particularly in, in some of the uh, social communications we have. But I remember Don talking about the fact that um, communications were particularly important in the Three Mile Island or the lack of accurate communications. I um, Don was going to give this talk, and I just uh, sort of assumed that uh, uh, Don got interested in nuclear energy after he finished and retired at Hope. And like most of us, we take up uh, another pastime and find something of interest. But boy, was I wrong. Don grew up in uh, western Pennsylvania, a little bit north of Pittsburgh, and uh, he grew up in coal country. He saw coal mines. He saw coal mine cave-in widows. He saw farmland being destroyed and ripped up for strip mining. Saw old men sitting in park benches spitting blood from their um, black lung disease. Um, that was in... Uh, in the year in the mid 50s, he then went to Muskingum College, and there also was coal mining in uh, western uh, or in eastern Ohio. Uh, tops of mountains were being carved off, and uh, the coal taken out of these mines. So Don developed quite an interest in nuclear energy and a real passion for it at that point. Now this was 1958, so he has had a long interest in in nuclear energy. Um, when he was at uh, uh, Muskingum, uh, he was a, a really a bright uh, student in the sciences and the chemistry. And one of his professors uh, recommended him for a job at the Shippingport Atomic Power Station, which is the nation's first commercial, commercial nuclear reactor. He was involved 
in analyzing the upstream and downstream uh, quality of the water, the um, turbine condensate and primary loop water in the facility. And again, he became more and more interested in nuclear. And uh, from Don, uh, Don's quote, it says, I saw no piles of coal, no railroad crossings blocked by coal trains. I saw no soot, saw no bottom ash, no smokestacks, no smoke. I fell in love with nuclear power. It was clean. During his life, he had taught chemistry uh, for much of his career, and uh, but always kept up uh, an interest and did a lot of reading in nuclear energy, even uh, taught some when he was at Hope. He saw the weakness to be the reactive uh, nuclear reactor waste and um, spent a whole year, a sabbatical year from 1988 to 89, working at the DC office of the Civilian Radioactive Waste Management in the Department of Energy. After that, he consulted with them for many years and, uh, uh, in fact, went on some a number of speaking tours throughout the country, um, working with uh, um, in nuclear energy. Um, he said that that really helped improve both his teaching and his public speaking, and he has done that off and on since that time. Once he retired, he uh, um, joined HASP and is one of our members and continued his interest and uh, uh, now, and some of you may have remembered a few years ago, a marvelous three lecture series on Chernobyl. And uh, I thought that that was just excellent. I can still see videos of that huge uh, concrete um, uh, containment device being slowly pulled over the reactor to seal it off in Chernobyl. And I thought it was an excellent talk. And some of the other talks that Don has given have been very good. Really looking forward to that today. Um, when um, he was decided that he could would give a couple talks here on the one on TMI today and, and on Dow next week, um, he had gotten information from a bunch of um, publications and from talking to some people. But recently, he's been able to talk or to have firsthand communication with some of the um, uh, management or some of the managers and the scientists that were on duty that night at Three Mile Island, and we'll include that in his talk today. So at this point, we're really excited about listening to Don and giving his talk today, and the one next week, and then the third one on nuclear power future, which is for the Science and Technology Committee in about two and a half weeks. So at this point, we'd like to welcome Don, and uh, Don, we're anxious to hear your talk. <clears throat> It's a pleasure to be here. I just love to talk. Um, <clears throat> those who people who put me on national tours to speak about nuclear energy taught me that the first four or five sentences no one can hear. They're just getting attuned to your level of speech, your volume, your pace. And the very best way to win your audience is over is to make some self-deprecating humor. Well, I have no idea what that is because there's nothing to self-deprecate. I mean, look at me. I am still wearing my Halloween costume. Uh, don't you see? I'm an 18-year-old at heart, but I'm dressed up as an 84-year-old fart. Okay, let's, let's get started. Maybe overly detailed, I don't know, uh, but there were failures in communication, engineering, and design and training. I took the Three Mile Island accident 40 some years ago, very seriously. And I thought, oh my goodness, here's the decline of the industry. I don't know if it was correlation, but uh, everything I first read about the Three Mile Island incident was who did it. And I'm not sure we should focus on who, but how it happened. So we're gonna take a look at that before we're all done. Well, he told you most of those things about me. As starting fourth from the bottom, I trust the science of accelerated climate change due to global warming. Coal country made me pro-nuke. I visited TMI and its neighbors. And um, through a connection that um, Lauren put me on to, I've been an email friendship. I've developed an email friendship with Eric Hitz who was an operator in the adjacent control room that night, came over to the disaster control room and worked for 16 hours. He and I have talked, and I'm going to share some of his insights with you too. Uh, two corrections on the handout. 
they're trivial. But uh, at the end of the first line of the second paragraph, the word is meant to be nucleus. It needs a U in it. And um, on the lower right of the figure, only partially shown, that's to be a uranium, to one of the forms of uranium. Those are minor uh, errors, but my spell check and my attention didn't catch them at first. Two corrections on the handout. I guess you would have figured them out without my guidance. Well, here we are. We're safe. There are no drugs, nuclear weapons allowed inside. So here we go. TMI, you ask. If you're under 30, it's too much information. If you're over 60, immense thallium myocardial imaging, one of those heart scans. If you're over 70, it's too much internet. But that for most of us, it's the site of the nation's first serious nuclear accident. Accident, incident, failure, interesting. More formally, Three Mile Island Unit Number 2, Middletown, Pennsylvania, March 28th, 1979, starting at four in the morning. <clears throat> Are these events related? The movie, The China Syndrome, that incident, and nuclear power plant closings. Are they also, how related are they? Is that why we switched from nuclear to uh, fossil fuels again? Well, my contention is emphatically yes. Uh, you, you'll notice that almost everything I say is already on the slide. Uh, the vicissitudes of being an old man and COVID ramping through Freedom Village, I prepared this weeks ago. And I'm as surprised as you are for what the slides are going, what the next slide's going to be. Uh, but I'm going to use them as my notes, okay? Uh, there were communication errors, and it tells us how expensive the inn can be with what happened up at Midland. Um, and there are important lessons to be learned about how we fix blame. Lessons to be learned. Yes, we can learn to better communicate. There's some science to be learned, some history, and then I have an obsession. I just can't let go of this story because I fell in love, as Lauren told you, I fell in love with nuclear power and I hated to see it uh, suffer. And throughout this talk, I'm going to try the worker's perspective to the extent that I can. A brief commercial message, why nuclear power at all? Well, because a little pencil, a pellet, the size of a pencil eraser, equals 120 gallons of oil or a ton of coal for the energy. And that's why we go with nuclear. It's so energy dense. Why do we go with nuclear at all? Because the plant takes a lot less space than a wind farm or a bunch of solar panels. It's energy dense. So those are, but you, that's another whole presentation. Um, which power source is most deadly? I listened to the people called the Canary Media Source. See that down at the bottom, the Canary Media Source? They tell us about the deaths from accidents and air pollution per unit of electrical power. Coal comes out hatefully. Oil, biomass, gas, hydropower, wind, nuclear, solar. Look down there, nuclear, one of the safest. And these include... Um, nuclear accidents and incidents, and includes Fukushima and uh, Chernobyl. So I wondered who is Canary Forum? And they're sponsored by the RMI. Who are they and where they get their data? They grew out of, some of you people my age remember, Amory Lovins, Mr. Um, Clean Earth, Stanford group physicist. He formed a group called the Mount, Rocky Mountain Institute. Now they're a worldwide group of young journalists worried about climate change. They remind us that still a third of the world's electricity comes from coal, the harm of which is mostly air pollution. It ne they neglect global warming because it's hard to quantify. Their stats include mining, the plants, transportation. Their data include Chernobyl and Fukushima. Their data is all from public sources. But still, in spite of all that good data, nuclear power is losing out. I mean, it, nuclear plants are an endangered species. 
nuclear fission, fission chips? Oh, no, no, we manufacture computer chips for nuclear reactors. There's a chunk of highly enriched, uh, of uh, depleted geranium, the fission of bisotosin take out. It's incredibly dense. It's a nice silvery, shiny metal, and it's slightly radioactive, and you'd want to wear gloves when you handle it. But I thought you would like to see what uranium looks like. Back to our story, how a couple of simple communication errors contributed to an industrial decline. So here we go now. Oh, our hindsight's perfect. TMI, Midland, Chernobyl. There are many factors in the nuclear decline. TMI was an important key. But Jimmy Carter didn't like nuclear. He was trained in the nuclear Navy, but he didn't. He called it the last resort form of energy. So he didn't help it any. Um, what if there had been no big deal at Three Mile Island? What if it had just an incident that lasted for two hours? And what if there had been no evacuation? Please remember those last questions. Maybe we'd still see nuclear power thriving. No million dollar reactor ruined. No billion dollar cleanup. Two hours, it could have been confined to two hours. Um, several factors. Midland, you ask? That two, two reactors, 87% done. Consumers energy ran out of money at about six billion and they walked away. That's a story for next week. Yes, it got converted and it's gas fired and it's a plant similar to the one we have in Holland. But that, that's next week's stories. We don't wear glasses on our asses because our hindsight's always right. First up, the communication problems. I belong to the Institute for Advanced Hindsight. Watch for, scram. Watch for, it's been closed. Watch for, we're going to have an operational evacuation, whatever in the devil that means. I wonder who's in charge, to whom should I be listening? 400 reporters, each wanting the scoop. Hollywood in the movie, The China Syndrome. Spoiler alert. TMI was the accident that started a nuclear decline. A simple communication misunderstanding, lack of human factor design in the re control room, and overtraining of young minds. Now you can take a nap, because the next part, I'm going to get down into the weeds, and then I'll come back to things that are more understandable. So forgive me while we go into the weeds. Nuclear was going to be big. How about those six reactors in Ukraine? That country's 55% nuclear electricity. In the whole continent of Europe, that's the largest single plant with six reactors. And now it's used as a hostage and a, a danger to us. It's a new reason to be anti-nuclear. Well, 1974 to 82, TMI started in 79. There were 100 nuclear power plants canceled, some of them half constructed, just in the United States. Due to high interest rates, lower energy demand, high cost to build, and eventually cheaper natural gas. I don't know how you feel about fracking, but those of us from Pennsylvania are ambivalent about it. And sure enough, it's a campaign issue in the senatorial race in Pennsylvania. Nukes were no longer the bridge between coal to renewables. Um, now, any excuse to close, especially facing economic doom. I mean, the Calhoun nuclear plant in Nebraska, a small one in 73, shut down in 2016, too small, inefficient to match gas prices. The Clinton plant in Clinton, Illinois, a big one, began in 87, shut down in 2017. 
lower gas prices, lack of state bailout for clean air support, and like wind, the uh, support for wind and solar. Um, Quad cities, same story, lower gas prices, lack of state bailout for clean air support. Oh, oh, any power plant, but especially nuclear power plants need a lot of cooling water. And when the river gets too warm, it doesn't cool as well. Who would have guessed that global warming, clear, warm rivers are gonna be a problem for nuclear power plants? Just a second of backing up. What makes that nuclear power plant go is steam coming out of the key kettle. Here at Whistling, it wants out as it expands. So you boil water, that steam turns a turbine, turns a generator. Cool. That's half the story. Not only do you need a heat source to make steam to push the turbine, on the other side, you need a lot of cooling water to take that steam and collapse it back to water, sucking the steam through. Push it because it's boiling, suck it through because it's condensing. So the, one of the keys is lots of cooling water. Um, Plymouth, Massachusetts, low gas prices, lack of state bailout for clean air support, small plant. How many of these do you want me to do? They replaced the steam generators. They still vibrated. It was a bad site to begin with. It was going to cost too much to make it earthquake proof. Uh, Crystal River, Florida, expensive to require, repair the con, cracks in the containment building. Uh, Conway, uh, Wisconsin, could not match gas prices. I have a dozen more slides, but you get the point, right? Once there were 104 reactors. Now there are 92. We've seen a decline. Do I need to make say anything else? I made that point. For us, the nearest uh, shutdown is the uh, Palisades plant. Bill A, 67 to 70, full power in 73. The nameplate said 800 megawatts. It reached a peak of 833 megawatts. What's a megawatt? Well, it's on the handout, uh, a list of what, how many of the plant sizes and various, to give you context. Um, <clears throat> after a 577 day run, they shut down on May 20th. 600 workers became about 250 plus or minus. It had a troubled first few years. They had to replace a steam generator. That's a big deal. They had to cut a hole in the containment building. The containment building, four feet of concrete. Had to dig a hole to get the uh, steam generators out. Uh, Consumers Energy sued Bechtel, who was building it, and Combustion Engineering, who gave them the steam generators, and only lately started to really make money, but can't compete with gas-powered plants. There's a record up to 2011. You can see there were some spotty years, years when they had trouble. Uh, it wasn't the best plant at the beginning, and it turned out to be a pretty good one. But it's going to, it's shut down now, been sold to Holtec, a decommissioning company. A lot of people would like to see it revived. Well, if you were going to shut it down, if you knew you were going to end its life, you'd run it into the ground. You let a lot of routine maintenance suffer. And sure enough, to bring it back to good standards, is going to be very expensive. Oh, you don't need to rebuild the concrete, but the reactor itself, not only do you need a refueling, but you need a lot of repair, and then all the paperwork to get going, and then hire back your workers. I would like to see it rejuvenated. I don't think it's going to happen. Well, anyway, you have this as a handout uh, to help you give some perspective to what a megawatt is. Um, the Hong BPW plant with the two smokestacks, 145 megawatts. And then they have a four peaking units that give them another 183 megawatts. Fermi one, it ran for a little while, shut down. There's, it's a famous story. That's another story. But it's, it was 94 megawatts. 
Fermi 2 is still running. Detroit Edison runs it over in Monroe, 1100 megawatts, Big Rock. <laughs> Big Rock was a little bit like a loss leader. They, the people sold them on consumers energy that lowballed the price to help get nuclear started. It was only 67 megawatts and it never made a lot of money, but it's been shut down. Palisades, we just did that. Um, the coal burners, no, no, the, the, the one, the other nuclear power plant in the state of Michigan, Cook one and two down near Stevensville, together those two reactors, 2,300 megawatts. Um, drive down the freeway to Chicago and you approach the Indiana border and you go by where those plants are. Do you notice off on the right, to the right of the freeway, big boulders in the woods? Part of the security for that plant. So boulders so close together, you can't quite get your Jeep in there. A terrorist can't get into the plant. It's part of the plant security. It's not part of the scenery. In some of these nuclear power plants, 50% of the budget is security. Half the money. Now, if you're anti-nuclear, here's how to do it. You're not against safety, are you? Well, then we could ask for another barrier. We could ask for another guard. You're not against safety, are you? And you just keep selling one new safety feature after another till it becomes so darn expensive, you can't run the plant. But with half the payrolls, security, good heavens. I mean, I used to take my students to the Palisades plant, tour the control room. Oh no, can't go into control. Okay, so we looked at where the waste was stored. Now there's a man standing there with an AK-47. Can't get anywhere close. Um, there's a good way to be anti-nuclear. Just demand or sell more security. Who's against safety? Well, anyway, oh, and a whole lot of that security down at Cook 1 and 2, it is because it's one of the largest interconnections in the grid. Electricity to Chicago, Indiana, and Southern Michigan. Electricity to Indiana. That grid connection is major. It's all probably more vulnerable than the plant itself. And sure enough, when we listen to the news out of Ukraine, they're bombing the grid. So you're not surprised there's a problem, a lot of security at Cook 1 and 2. Now, just for perspective, the coal burner, now if you're anti-coal, pro-nuke like I am, what you call that is the dirt burner. The dirt burner up at Port Sheldon, uh, 1,560 megawatts in three different units. But that's another story. We retired the BPW as a de young plan, but you can still see it. To help you uh, with perspective, Michigan's a relatively flat state. So the most powerful hydroelectric plant we ever had was 30 megawatts at the Hardy Dam. Some of you have seen the Allegan Dam, it's only three megawatts. To run a, a fr in the winter, a frozen wind turbine when ice becomes a problem, it costs as much as six megawatts. Those turbines are big and hard to keep turning. So I'm trying to give you some perspective. And there's where all those plants are. The two marked with question marks are part of next week's lecture. The plans that were going to be that are no longer. But there's all the plants that I just referenced, okay? And where they were in the map. Maybe it's a little hard to notice that the Palisades plant, I put it, I was running out of room on the lake. So I put it there. And I put a picture of the spent fuel cast where they store the nuclear waste. You'll get another picture of that soon. Okay, my older look at Three Mile, and I've given this talk before, was from this report. The president of Dartmouth College came during the disaster, gathered a lot of data, highly respected, and he issued a report, and it had, became, had become my basis. It pretty much blamed the workers, the operators that night. Since then, Greg Hitz, the fellow at the other TMI-1, just a few feet away at the other unit, uh, he put me onto this report. Many more pages written by lawyers. And I'm going to guess these lawyers were mostly defense attorneys. 
because they write with a very human perspective. Um, with understandable language and recommendations for everyone, they took the task the owners, the operators were wrong, the media made a crisis out of nothing, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission really failed and Congress should have done some things and didn't. This report is uh, really opened my eyes. I'm going to refer to it a couple of times as the R and F report, the names of the two key uh, lawyers. Um, it's two volumes long. It's 800 pages long. Uh, transcripts, data, legal consultants, set, not 800, 785 pages, tables and tables and tables of data. I've read every word of it. An emphasis that I never saw before, very poorly designed control room. There's not one place to stand and see everything. At least 35% of the controls and dials and charts are not visible to any one person. We've got a human engineering problem. Very critical in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, hereafter called the NRC. They were disjointed, uninformed, and overworked. There were lots of new plants being applied for. They had newly been formed. They didn't know exactly their own role. So there's a lot of reasons to be confused, left and right. But let me read some of the language with you from that report. It was approaching 4 a.m., the downhill side of the graveyard shift, and four operators are moving through the routines of Unit 2 plant through Mount Island, a million dollar, a billion dollar facility, and just now it's under the complete control of this youthful quartet. All high school graduates, coincidentally, all veterans in the nuclear Navy, all veterans of the nuclear Navy, all veterans of the nuclear Navy. That's going to be important to points I'm about to make. Um, control room operators, Greg and Ed, are quietly monitoring, making adjustments to more than critical hundreds of instrument indicators in the brightly lit control room. Um, let's skip to the last paragraph. Since it first went critical, starting up exactly a year before, Unit 2 has been bedeviled by a series of mishaps, mostly minor, but troublesome. It's been running reasonably well, however, since it went into commercial operation on December 30th, New Year's Eve Eve. The plant went into full-blown operation on New Year's Eve. You don't suppose that the date has something to do with when bonds are due, when financing arrangements have to be met. You don't suppose there was any rush, do you? Well, I raise the suspicion. Um, there's Pennsylvania. There's where TMI is, just south of the capital Harrisburg. And if it matters, there's where I came from, Western Pennsylvania, okay? Um, TMI financially and geographically. A rush start, New Year's Eve, and an important watershed, 10 miles from the state capital, close to Philadelphia, and the media centers of Washington, D.C., and New York City. And uh, it's going to be 906 megawatts. There's what it looks like. These are the containment buildings for Unit uh, uh, 2, Unit 1. Those are the cooling towers. If you haven't got enough cooling from the river water alone, you build towers to cool that condensate water. If you weren't an educated HAFS member, some of you may have guessed that's where the reactor is. Nope, it's in this building of four feet of concrete. And there's the steam generators, uh, and the turbines and all that, and some administration buildings. Oh, right adjacent to the, uh, the fuel handling where your spent fuel comes back out. But it's a big deal. It employs a lot of people. Aerial view. 
the southern unit is unit two, the one in red. Greg Hitz is working in the green unit. It's 4 a.m. The green unit number one is going to be shut down in a day or two for refueling. So he's just watching his plant wind down and the other plant has a problem. He finishes shift, he goes over to TMI two and he works the next 16 hours as part of the crisis management. <laughs> the crisis, it lasted a week. Looking north, Susquehanna River. It generates some of the most expensive real estate in central Pennsylvania. I'm there, I'm surveying people. The most expensive lands on the hillside looking over the plant. By the way, all containment buildings were built to withstand a hit from a Boeing 727 at 200 knots. Especially important here, two and a half miles from the Harrisburg Airport with in and out traffic of probably 60,000 a year. So it's important that those containment buildings, not the cooling towers, the containment buildings are structurally sound. It's a rural sort of place. 359, unit one where Greg is working is shut down for refueling. After four and a half years, it's gonna be shut down for two, three months and be refueled. It's ready to, the one, oh, it's ready to start up the very next day. Uh, Greg hits us at unit one control room. Unit two is at 97% power. Then at four o'clock, the turbine tripped. Hmm. That means it quit making electricity, quit getting steam. Three minutes later, the reactor scram. Five o'clock, Greg joins a troubled crew at TMI2. He and I develop an email relationship. First communication error. Within three seconds, they had a scram. What's that mean to you? See the scram button? Press that button if you're in trouble. That's the scram button. Safety control rod axe man, scram. Now this is an almost true story. The very, very first reactor. Of course these people are, new, are nervous, but up above there's a fellow with an ax ready to chop a rope with his ax that will let the control rod drop down and shut it all down. He's the safety control rod ax man. But those officials came out and said to the public not to worry. Within a few seconds, we had a scram. Does that comfort you? We had a scram? What a poor choice of acronyms. Put yourself in this, you're there. Imagine a car crash. Recall an airline disaster. It's visible. It's quick. Even a house fire, in two or three hours, it's over. You can see it, smell it, and feel it. This one's invisible, it's long lasting, and it gives off no odor. You're looking at thousand switches and knobs and alarms and flashing red lights. That's all you see. It's new this accident, and it's very big, and it's technical and complicated. Well, I'm going to show you several pictures of nuclear power plants, so many and different, but they'll all start looking alike. But I wanted to show you that in the control, in the containment building, there's no people. There's a nuclear reactor. There are big pumps, huge pumps, important pumps, and they pump the hot water from the reactor through these that meet some other water and turn that other water into steam. And that steam is sent away to turn the turbine. Roughly, that's what it looks like. There's an access to get the spent fuel out, but there's nobody in there. There's a crane and there's four feet of concrete. Got a rough picture? Because they're going to see different pictures. 
equally complicated, but note the structure of the containment building. Some of them are two layers thick. There's a reactor down there, the crane, a bunch of hardware. Um, okay, <clears throat> one more time. The reactor sends super hot water to a steam generator and it comes back cooled to get become hot water again. It becomes hot water, gives up its heat to some other water and goes back to get heated again. And there's a big pump moving that water. There are the control rods in case there's a disaster, you shut it down. Now these steam generators, they're not unlike the radiator in your car. You want thin walled, skinny tubes and a lot of them. You want a lot of them with a super hot water on the inside. You want them small so, so you can have many to give off their heat to the other surrounding water. Huh, steam generators, small, thin walled. They go bad from time to time. Okay, that water turns into steam and it pushes a turbine and a generator. Wonderful. But the other secret is do something to cool that and send that condensate, the condensed water, back with another pump to the steam generator to be boiled again. One loop, the primary loop, a secondary loop, and then something to do cooling, a third loop. Well, let me try to see one more diagram. This is the one we're going to stick with primarily for a while. Reactor. Oh, this little thing becomes important. A pressurizer. It's got a heater in it and it's got cold water sprinklers. The pressurizer is sure to keep this water at high pressure so it will not boil. So darn squeezed, it can't boil. And if it gets too hot, spray in some cold water. If the pressure drops, turn on the heater and boil some more water, but keep the pressure high. And furthermore, always keep some steam in there as a cushion. So you have a little give and take the whole system. Um, there's a secondary loop from the steam generator. Oh, here's the third loop in this diagram either to a cooling tower or to a river. Okay, reactor, steam generator, primary loop, 580 degrees, hot, 2200 PSI. Secondary loop, about 500 degrees, 900 PSI. Your tap water, please, it's about 50 to 6 to 70 PSI. I mean, these are high pressure. Okay, he reminded you, I got a good summer job. I'm at Shipping Port, first a commercial plant. I'm analyzing the water, the Ohio River upstream, the Ohio River downstream. Samples of primary loop water, samples of secondary loop water, all these things I'm, being che I'm checking. I'm sent out to get a sample of primary loop water, 2200 PSI. I'm given a little bit of plumbing and a stainless steel bulb with some plumbing around it and valves. Um, there's a little jet at the end of the control uh, containment building. I'm to put my gizmo on there, tighten it with a wrench, open, close the valve, some water comes into my little container. I take that to the lab after I undo the plumbing. I'm a smart ass 18 year old. What's 2200 PSI water look like? Before I put my gadget on to collect it, I'll just open that and shut it real quick and see what 2200 PSI water looks like. Okay, that's stupid. Shouldn't have done that. But the whole thing is set up that it won't let out more than a pint and it shuts itself off. They, they knew there were gonna be Smart 20 year olds out there fooling around. Well, anyway, I opened that and shut it, and that water went across the field to the next building, and I don't think it dropped an inch. It would have taken someone's leg off. It was terrible. I was impressed with what I shouldn't have done that, but I now I know what 2200 PSI water looks like. 
I tell you that story because I needed to confess. I tell you that story to help you feel this place, okay? Oh, and now key to what we're doing to do, huge reactor coolant pumps or primary loop pumps or secondary loop pumps. But here they're gonna be called RC pumps, reactor cooling pumps. See, suddenly my perspective switched. Those are pumps to get the heat out and get the heat where we can use it. When you wanna cool the reactor, they're the same pumps to bring cooling water in. Sometimes you wanna make heat, sometimes you wanna put cooling in. It's just your perspective. If you're making electricity or if you're cooling down from an accident. Okay. Um, I'm gonna move though, one more diagram. I'm gonna move from that one you saw with the pressurizer to a little more detail. At the top of the pressurizer, there's a relief valve. Can um, Don? Ink. Oh, sorry. The people online cannot actually see the clicker um, dot. So, can you just describe what you were just pointing to there? Say that again. Sorry, the people, the virtual participants, cannot see the clicker dot, oh. the red dot. <clears throat> oh. Okay. Up at the top of the pressurizer, a re special relief valve. If this gets too high a pressure, if this runs out of a cushion of steam that valve is gonna open up. You're gonna see more of it in the next diagram. The system shuts down, just cool the reactor with any run of three emergency systems. But the primary one I wanna to call to your attention is this relief valve I've drawn in, in magenta. It's a PORV valve. Now, some people call it the pilot operated relief valve. Some call it the pressure operated relief valve. Some call it the power operated relief valve. That's a PORV. And it's supposed to open when things are getting too high pressure and it's supposed to shut itself down. It doesn't. Um, pressure builds up in the reactor. The PORV pops open as designed, but didn't close down later as designed. It was supposed to be open for 13 seconds. It was open for four and a half hours. What a difference that makes. The operators couldn't figure out the lowering pressure, but rising temperature in the core, readout printers all running behind. You'll get, I'll say that again when I get there. Pressure building up everywhere. Water and steam are both circulating. The pumps are built to pump water not steam. You don't pump steam. The pumps are going to go bad. They're going to vibrate like crazy. They're huge. They're as tall as this room. And they start vibrating. That's a problem. Okay. Navy training. Never. Never let that pressurizer, pressurizer get full. In Navy talk, it's never let it get solid. But always keep a steam cushion. That's the end of your instruction in the Navy. Never let that get full of water. Got it? You can't leave my Navy. You can't be my Rickover nuclear Navy if you get pat, if you don't learn that. Never let that become just full of water. In simulators, if it did, the simulation's over, it's the end of the story. They were never trained for this. These guys were all nuclear Navy. They all had more than five years of experience. They all had above average scores in the exams by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. They weren't college educated. They were incredibly well-trained in the Navy. Trained in the Navy. And the simulation quit if that pressurizer got full of water. Game over in the simulator. Here's a bunch of control men looking at game over. Although it's a cartoon here, it was the end of the Navy nuclear training. If the pressurizer ever filled with just water, 
had no steam in it, the sub would experience a water hammer, pipes would break, the sub would sink. It's that simple. You know, uh, water hammers, um, a cushion so that when water sh valves shut on and off abruptly, you don't get a rattle through your whole house. In my Freedom Village laundry room, there they are, those two little cylinders of air just to be the cushion so you don't hear the pipes bounce. All modern domestic plumbing is protected from water hammers, so we take them for granted. Here's a pair of my Freedom Village laundry room, okay? I once toured one of the big refineries down in Whiting, Indiana. Great big stills, distillation units. Petroleum comes in, some of it gets burned to heat the thing, and the easily boiled stuff becomes kerosene and whatnot, then gasoline, then heavier things, and then tar. And then if you don't cook it, you cook it just the right amount, you get asphalt. Cook it to dryness, you get charcoal briquettes. And I went in the control room, and it's a room twice the size, and there's five consoles and five young men running them. 24-7, they sit those consoles and run their distillation unit in the refinery. I said, well, it's an important job, dangerous. Those things are expensive. They catch fire, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and some people have to work the graveyard shift. Where do you get young men that we won't take college grads? We only want high school grads that we can train. They're not to think for themselves. They're to be trained what to do and keep that refinery that's still running. And I also thought, well, if they're just high school grads, just. If they're high school grads, maybe they're more amenable to working the graveyard shift. I wonder if that applies to this nuclear Navy these men were in. I don't know. But anyway, system shut down. Now just cool the reactor with that valve wide open. Water starts flooding that containment building. And it overflows into the auxiliary building. 900,000 gallons of hot water with radioactive debris in it, with stuff in it. And it's got some tritium being made, but slightly radioactive. 900,000 gallons fill the containment building floor. Some pump moves it to the auxiliary building. Oh my God, the, the alarms are sounding everywhere. There are 104 bells ringing, flashing lights and alarms, chaos. Now, those pumps, they pump water, not steam. They're vibrating. They're seriously got to be shut down intermittently. I mean, these pumps weigh 70 tons. They can hold three tons of water. They can move 100,000 gallons of water a minute. They're huge. They're important. They're somewhat delicate. So you're careful what you do. Chaos, the operators. I know what let's do. Let's call Lee. Now, Lee Rogers was the lead construction engineer at his home, Babcock and Wilcox. They built and supplied the reactor. Lee Rogers is at home. I mean, he's built this plant. It's six in the morning. They call Lee. Ed Fredericks is working there. He wakes him up and details the situation. And Lee says, well, you better manually flip the switch to shut the PORV valve. It's on the left control room panel. He knows where the switch is. He wants that valve shut so that there won't be any more overflow at the top of the pressurizer valve. Ed sends his co-operator, Craig, over to do that. And Ed tells Craig, hey, Craig, tell Lee it's been closed. Meaning now. But Lee hears it's been closed all along. It's six o'clock in the morning. He gets wakened up and he gets a bunch of data. It's been closed now or all along. What a world of difference that makes. It's been closed. Lee suggests a string of logical corrective actions, believing the valve to be 
closed all along. His suggestions are heeded and carried out, worsening the situation. No one realized that the reactor is ruined, that parts are melting, fuel is spilling to the bottom, the plant is ruined, that there's nearly a million gallons of water floating around these two buildings. It's been closed. The reactor, a little bit of steam in it, a lot of steam in it. It, uh, it just starts melting. Pictures to show what happens at two hours, three hours, and four hours. It gets redder, support rods are breaking. We're going to pot. Cartoon break, risk management. Be careful. All you're going to say is be careful. Wait a minute, Don. Why did the turbine trip in the first place? In a word, bad design. That secondary loop water running by those thin walled copper tubes like a radiator, that water picks up debris, erosion, corrosion things. It's got to be cleaned. It runs through what are cleaners. No, no, no. In the business, we call them polishers. Ion exchange resins, little beads that like a water softener, and it's going to collect these beads. Well, some of those beads clump up, and they clumped up and clog a water return to the, in the cooling pump. One polisher, there are eight polishers. The, the condensate water is going to go back and become heated, it boiled again. And it's a large volume of hot water, but it all should be cleaned. It should be run through a, a polisher. There are eight of them. They're pretty big, but there are eight of them. The design is such that if one clogs, all eight shut down. Why in the devil would you design it that way? I mean, the ion exchange resin clogs up the feed water to the steam generator. All eight polishers shut down. Heat is not being taken from the reactor, building high pressure. The turbine trips, the reactor scrams, the POV valve opens. It fails to close automatically. Operators can't believe the reactor needs so much water to cool it down. They often shut off very reactor cooling pumps. Also, the pumps are vibrating. They can't be run continuously. They flood the auxiliary building. The core is uncovered. It partly melts. It's ruined. Then there's a hydrogen gas problem, but that's a distraction. That's not key. Here's three of the polishers, three of the eight polishers. Resin beads, little plastic beads. I meant to bring some, but trust me, little yeah, plastic beads look like rice. They look like rice. Uh, they're compressed by 5,000 5, tons of water moving through. And they clogged in the number seven tank. The workers tried some high pressure water, then some high pressure air as a backwash. Then everything got quiet. Over the previous 10 hours, a small leak had let some beads move up and clogged the pneumatic control valves of all eight polishers. A water hammer came through broke a pipe and shut eight valves at once. No water to the steam generators, the core cooling system, trip and scram. There's control room. Short list of design problems. Water polishers that clog up, stopping one stops them all. The PORV valve indicator on the control room only shows if power was delivered to the valve switch not the position, only shows you on the control panel if you sent power. The control room design, not everything is visible. Can you see those lines I've drawn there? What's visible while standing or seated? Even if you stand up, you can't see everything. That next day, when it's daylight and the other shift comes on, a different operator stands by each panel of the control room so they can verbally yell to each other what they're seeing, because the operator can't see everything. 
complex system, 100 alarms. Oh, maintenance tags, safety tags, hid some indicator lights. Difficult environment in which to think. Normal time, TMI2 control room. Maintenance tags in just one part of the panel. Some of those tags indicate that um, change in the readings. This dial is off 10%. This one only is being shut down. Those maintenance tags, safety tags, all over the place. Meantime, the operator is getting an alarm for this problem, and then the problem moves down the chain, he gets another alarm, and then the problem moves down the further in the system, he gets another alarm. Cascading alarms for the same problem. The poor devil's over, the guy's overwhelmed. The reactor pressure light is next to the elevator power light. Well, they had to have a place to put it on the control panel. Is that the elevator light or the reactor pressure light? Give me a break. Now, after TMI, all control rooms are much better human engineered. There's fewer reflections, more of it's visible, it's systematized, it's much different. Furthermore, they're pretty much alike. Greg Hitz, my new email friend, is on the phone late in the day. There he is. He reports that with calls to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, calls to the builders, calls to the state regulators, calls to the federal regulators, and calls coming in from news agencies from the state on just three phone lines. So you're limited to how many people you're communicating with and you're yelling across the room, what just happened? Well, by the time you get the word to the right source on your phone, you're out of date and you look stupid. Well, here's the name, I'm gonna skip through here. These are all the people that were in that control room that, that the whole next day. But I wanna call your footnote to the bottom. Juanita Ginrich, when the turbine isn't spinning, you have a problem. It's warm and it's still, and it'll sag. You ought to spin it every once in a while with a big wrench or a, an auxiliary motor. Juanita is down there almost 30 hours before anyone remembers. She's down there turning the turbine every once in a while so that the blade doesn't get warped. God bless Juanita. <clears throat> Compare the control room of that nuclear to a nuclear sub the RNF report has many major changes to suggest. In a nuclear reactor, you're supervised, you're trained, you're community, you're quick and easy, you're next to everybody, you're shared responsibility, it's human engineered, each person is key. At TMI, the boss is behind a glass walled room, two operators in a locked room, glass covered dials, often opaque to reflection or location. Too huge to read all the gauges. The graveyard shift at this plant has 12 people on that shift. Two in the control room, one supervisor. That's all. Only nine other people. Let's read some more from the FNR report. Certainly the initial meshing of this emergency machinery in the control room is something short of symphonic. The people have been on duty from the start are frustrated. There's good reason, now listen to this. There is good reason for them to suspect that their operator training and years of experience are serving them badly. In this event, none of the buttons they pushed or the switches they pulled have produced the needed magic. Intellect tells them they don't really know what's going on. Ego tells them none of the rest of these guys do either. And they're both right. How about these charts that record some measure? They, the paper comes down and it gets wound up in a chart. Well, this accident is hours long. You, if you don't look at it for that 15 minutes of showing, you don't know what happened an hour ago unless you untear the thing apart and unroll the scroll. Strip chart recorders that are Unless examined frequently, hid the data, 
in the roll-up chart, obscuring long-term trends. That valve had been a problem at the Davis-Bessey plant in Ohio, but it wasn't reported industry-wide and it wasn't called attention to. Before TMI, reactor owners competed. Now, your problem at your plant is my problem at my plant. And you share information and you look, because we're all in this nuclear industry together, but not at the beginning. Slow printing, do you remember matrix stock, matrix stock printers running slow? They often ran two, two and a half hours behind. How in the devil do you know what's going on? Now there's things that absorb hydrogen gas and the panels show you the whole system at one time. The control rooms look a lot different. There's a story in itself. Admiral Rickover, specific training is not always education, but in the industry, you respected nuclear Navy men. Their training was superb. They would not let a water hammer happen or it was all over. But after that, after that, no training. Amid the milling around and monitoring low grade apprehension, it's as if you showed up for the final exam and discover you've been studying the wrong textbook for the whole semester. That's how those poor devils felt. Last line. The answer in science is never shoot the messenger. Look beyond the messenger. Well, these guys are testifying. Submarine training never covered this situation. Now, we talk about how large the plant is by how many megawatts of electricity it makes, but really it's making three times that amount of energy. These things are big time energy, that nuclear nucleus releases lots of binding energy. And then there is this thing called the decay heat. You shut down the reactor and it's still hot. A uranium fissions unevenly, whatever, but they fission. They make brand new elements. Not, not unlike a pregnant mother fissioning and there's an upset woman who's been through distress and a screaming new creature. The U-235 splits and releases its binding energy and it made two new things, new things that are screaming and learning to stabilize and settle down. The mother goes through some trauma and has to settle down and get healed. The baby has to learn that we will feed them and we will change the diaper. These things, every time you give off radioactivity, every time it fissions, you get these new things, they're giving off heat. They're unstable, they're brand new products. And as they reach stability, as they grow and calm down, they give off energy. That's called decay heat. The decay heat is significant. It's 400, 240 times more decay heat than a nuclear sub. These guys weren't trained for this much decay heat. It can't be ignored. Oh, what's more, How dig this. The PORV valve had been leaking there for some months. So you didn't take its behavior all that seriously. What the, <clears throat> what the devil? Okay, we need a coffee break. I'm gonna to rush to the end. Evacuation and a horrible coincidence. An important and broad-based committee sits in a conference room and decides that if the radiation levels anywhere on the ground ever reaches 1200 millirems per hour, we're gonna evacuate. Skip 1200, skip millirems. It's the units I grew up with. Okay, you got that? We all agreed. That's what we'll have an evacuation. If it ever gets to 1,200 per hour on the ground. Whew. Well, that was a tough decision to come up with. Let's take a coffee break. Oh, by the way, at the same coffee break, the air surveillance team is there and a few lingering reporters. 
1,200 millirems per hour. The helicopter measurement at 8.01 that morning reports to the emergency management team at nine, we have 1,200 at the type of event, several feet above the ground for three seconds. Hot gases, three seconds, measured in the air, in the breeze, measured at about 250 feet above the ground. But we all agreed, 1,200 on the ground. Did you hear what I heard at coffee today? Someone at coffee heard the NRC had surveillance helicopter had mentioned 1,200. Isn't that what they just decided on? At the, oh no, ground or vent pipe? I heard 1,200. So we have an evacuation and the horrible coincidence. But the word got out from coffee time that officials were ignoring the raw data, lying to the public. I heard 1,200 without noting the distinction, vent pipe or on the ground. Mayor uh, Thornburg, he fully understands that situation. But the people are going to be confused. I know what, we'll have a partial evaluation. If you're pregnant, get out. You, you might be advised to leave. That's it, we'll have a partial evacuation. Sounds political, even today. He knew the truth, but we live in a world of perception. Thousands flee the nuclear plant area at homes. Engineers try to prevent a meltdown. And that's the way it is. Three days in a row, he opened with the hydrogen bubble. Yeah, a problem, but not a key to this at all. But that's how he opened his news. Three consecutive days scared the bejeebers out of people. Maybe this evacuation plan needs more work. I mean, it's a big deal, 140,000 people for a week, $7 million. Go live in the school gym, go find some relatives. This is a big deal. Company officials use scram situation where layer after layer of a company, then the NRC, then state officials took out. Who is in charge? To whom do you listen? What is a general emergency? This was too new. There were 12 spokespersons from seven agencies addressing 400 reporters. You're gonna get the story straight? I don't think so. Four N NRC commissioners each gave separate edicts. What should be done? Oh, and Greg, Gray Hitz told me the investors, the, the company that owned it was in New Jersey, near New York City. And, and he is sent to New York City to tell the story to the key investors. And he's flying back to Three Mile and back to Harrisburg. And uh, he has, they ask him to move his seat so the 60 Minutes crew can all sit together. 60 Minutes is coming to do a show on TMI. And they need to sit it together and talk it through. And Greg thinks I could have, well, I'll see what they have to say. What they had to say was, we want to be first. We want drama. If we get it wrong, we'll tell a correction later. They honestly thought you put two wires into a uranium atom and the electricity came out. They didn't know there was steam and all that, and turbines. They, uh, some honestly thought you put two electric wires into a uranium atom, you get electricity. Greg has so much to teach them and so little time, and thereafter, first and drama. Correct it later. Here's a chart of who's in charge. Please follow that. The PR person at the plant, the plant manager, the utility owner, the county sheriff, state health officials, the state government, the nuclear regulatory commissioners, plural. Imagine if you added MSNBC and Fox News today, what they do with it. Public confusion due to lack of information, distrust. Oh, let me back up. On the uh, right there is Denton. 
President Dartmouth, who wrote that first report that I cited. And then there's a period of growing distrust of establishments, of Vietnam War is just ending, of post-Watergate government distrust. We have anti-military, anti-nuclear protests in the United States and Europe. We have a distrust of corporations. And we have the anti-nuclear movie, China Syndrome. It was released 12 days before the accident. 12 days before the accident. And the word Pennsylvania and meltdown, wait a minute. <clears throat> Here's Henry, uh, Jack Lemon speaking to Jane Fonda. This is the scene in the movie where he answers the reporter's question, how large an area would be contaminated? And he answers, how about the size of Pennsylvania? 12 days before the accident. What's the public going to do? Overexposure to the media. Well, they're so close to Baltimore, Philadelphia. Susquehanna River is half the Chesapeake Bay, 12 days after the movie. Is it any surprise that President Carter visited? Well, that doesn't make it a circus. There he is with his moon boots and his wife. There he is next to Denton um, and Governor Thornburg. He came to offer assurance, but the moon boots only added to the stress. He was followed by Senators Gary Hart, Alan Simpson, and Representative Alan Hertel. If you're my age, you remember those names. Harrisburg mayor learned of the emergency at 9.15 in the morning. It had started at four in the morning. He heard about 9.15 when a Boston radio station called him for information. We got a communication problem left and right. Would you personally leave an area like this? Think through an evaluation, evacuation. It's a really big deal. And it's all over the news. It's everything we read then. Okay, Unit 1 has restarted. Six and a half years later, good. They rebuilt the control room and they retrained the operators and they modified the plant. Extensive public hearings, extensive protests. 30 years as one of the best operating reactors. My wife and I chatted at coffee shops, listened to faculty at Carlisle, Gettysburg, Franklin Marshall, and Dickerson College. I followed the story as an, quote, expert and as a former Pennsylvanian. On the 15th anniversary, Sue and I toured, interviewed, sat in coffee shops, and talked to the activists. 15 years after the accident, the most valuable real estate in all central Pennsylvania overlooks the plant. Well, the people are concerned about radiation. How many of you are concerned about radiation? Oh, 1,200 of you. Well, I only have 400 Geiger counters. Okay, you 400 get them for a month, record your data, then pass them on to this 400, you record your radioactive data, then pass them on to these people, record your radioactive readings, and then come back here. And so you pass them around for years, for 10 years, and what they learn, is that there's radon in the earth coming into their basins and giving them radiation. Has nothing to do with the power plant. It's stuff in the dirt. And they became alarmed about that. Oh, the, the, that accident? Well, they, they've repaired that now. They scared us, something terrible and for nothing. The two units employed about 500 people as they undergo decommissioning. They're both shut down now. Resident Mary Osborne still worries about how natural radon from the ground, as opposed to that from the power plant, is harming her. Aren't we smart afterwards? Sidney Decker wrote this book, The Field Guide to Understanding Human Error. With perfect hindsight, we don't wear glasses on our rear ends. I knew it all along, so I look for human errors. I have the outcome bias instead of trying to see through the eyes of the particip participants, the people who was there and were doing their best. What if you, after a disaster of any kind, you remove punishments? Come and tell me the truth. Don't cover your ass. Tell me what really happened. 
tell me how what you were trying to do. When we get a different story, that would enhance the true narratives. Okay. TMI2 is now closed six years later. Although license to run to 2034, shut down in 19, lower energy demand, gas costs, subsidized renewables. So we eat here and get gas. Special water cleaning equipment, special down in the water cleaning equipment, special containers to take the spent fuel out, high reactivity shipping casts, five years to remove all the spent fuel. Uh, it went by rail, uh, some of it by Union Pacific, some by Conrail, out to the Idaho National Engineering Lab. That's what the uh, containers look like, 125 casts from Three Mile Island to Idaho. In a, a billion dollars, it's been closed. We had a scram, 1,200 millirems per hour on the ground. There's it going into storage in Idaho. That's what it looks like now out in Idaho at the National Engineering Lab. Okay, that's enough. There's a historical plaque. We have switched to fossil fuels for the time being. That's where the spent fuel is stored at the Palisades plant. If you're anti-nuclear, you call it high-level waste. If you're um, pro-nuclear, you call it spent nuclear fuel or used nuclear fuel. Which term you use reveals which side of that spectrum you pro or anti-nuclear. Unless you have some more ran, some questions, I'll show you a bunch of random slides. But I'd really rather hear from you. Uh, Amy has a microphone, Lauren has a microphone, and my friend from Palisades is going to correct me, and I welcome it. No, I'm not going to correct you. You got everything right on as far as I can see. But you talked about <clears throat> dates. December 31, 1971. New Year's Eve was the first day Palisades plant went online. Oh, is that right? Also a New Year's Eve. It went online at, in the morning on the A ship from midnight to 8 a.m. And after one minute, tripped off. <laughs> so they put it, they checked things out. It was a turbine trip. Everything was still running fine. They put it back online. After one more minute, it tripped off again. I came on shift at 8 o'clock that morning. They had decided the problem was most likely the trip relay for the turbine, the turbine measures whether it's power going out or power coming in. You don't want the grid spinning your turbine. And that's what this relay does. And if it senses that the turbine might be being spun by the grid, it'll trip the turbine, that'll trip the reactor. So they figured this was miswired. They checked it. They flopped the leads over the other Miswired. Day. And they went, they went off shift and I came on yeah. shift and we put it online again. And this time it stayed online for about five hours, a few other problems developed, and we went down for about two months to fix those problems. Got to about 20% power. And the key and the timing was an apparent tax break that you could get for having generated commercial power in the calendar year 1971. You get a different tax break what year you start in. You have your child born on New Year's Eve, you deduct that kid for the whole year. Yeah, thank you for that story. We have we have a, a question from online. Um, Lori asked, and she she typed this question in when um, you were showing how the control room was not human engineered um, or human design wasn't factored in. Um, do you think the future of nuclear lies with the assistance of AI slash computer automation? How much faith do I put in a computer run control room, artificial intelligence? cathode ray tele LED displays. I don't know, it's better than what we had. It isn't perfect. I can't think of anything that doesn't come with a cost or a danger. But I think the plants are built much more safely. Don't get me started in Chernobyl. It took three class sessions here to do Chernobyl. Now that's as well as I can do, Amy. Anybody else, sir? 
What you described at the end there, the communication, the lack of people being in charge, sounds chaotic. Um, was that because there was no plan or was there some simulations prior to that and they just never followed it? I'm not sure which it is, but I got a tour about five years ago. I went down to Benton Harbor where the Palisades plant had opened their communication center in case they ever had a TMI. A, bay, a room this size with telephone and computer banks for reporters, for phones and banks for state regulators, for NRC people, for plant people, where they would meet, talk, and work it out and communicate better. In Benton Harbor, not at the plant, but a communication center, so we'd get it one story well told. So those th that tour of that communication center in Benton Harbor says to me, they had no experience. They never ran a simulation. They had no, this is the first time. That's as well as I can do. Get some more questions online. You're getting more questions than most of our speakers do from online. <laughs> so they really paid attention. Um, Bill asks, did not the Chernobyl incident years later really kill the nuclear industry? Who would want an incident like an incident like that near your home? Chernobyl. A big reactor, completely different design. One made for two reasons to more easily change fuel rods to make plutonium for bombs and to refuel without shutting down. It gets pretty darn cold in a Russian winter. Let's refuel without shutting down. Completely different design for those two reasons. Make plutonium, refuel without shutting down. And no containment building. 28 people lost their lives that first week. A lot of new uh, thyroid cancers, in children especially, mostly handled. How many deaths from Chernobyl? It really depends on who you ask. It really depends on who you ask. I won't say definitely, because I don't know definitely. Professor, uh, I just wanted to take the um, simulation just a little bit farther. One of the results out of uh, Three Mile Island accident was the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations was formed and you had to join. If you had a nuclear power plant, you had to join. If you decide you weren't going to join, they called the your board together and the board removed the CEO. That actually happened in a nuclear plant. And the impo then um, was run by Zach Pate, a former nuclear Navy guy, peer to uh, or subordinate of uh, Rickover. And emergency drills became commonplace. You'd have to run them every year with state agency involvement, where you're reporting data to the state. They're reporting to state police to go house to house for a mock evaluation. So it was much more exercised after Three Mile Island, after the impo recommendations were made. But, uh, but you went to down in, in uh, Ben Harbor was this. He references an impo, NIPO. Nuclear Institute of Power Operators. We share experiences, we share knowledge, and we get rid of bad operators. And we all, we're all in this together. Let's behave like that and get the bad apples out of the barrel. We have one more online question. How much of the nuclear fuel potential is actually used? Has there been continued development of how to use the rest of the fuel potential? <laughs> I'd also like to tack on something to that. I, I've heard that there's another element that is potentially being used for nuclear power. Is that true? Pull out the unused nuclear fuel, the spent nuclear fuel, the high-level waste. There's fuel that never got used. There's material that can be turned into fuel. There's materials not radioactive. We could reprocess this and get the unused fuel, get the stuff that's new fuel, and take the non-radioactive stuff. Oh, that's a lot of messy chemistry. And didn't you just isolate a little bit of plutonium? My name's Jimmy Carter, and I don't like plutonium. We're not going to reprocess it. 
It's expensive. It's delicate. The French do it in part. We don't. There's in the new in the industry, new talk about reprocessing because there's fuel that has not been properly used, completely used. In the third talk, a completely different group called that talk together. When we talk about the future nuclear industry, we're going to look at Bill Gates's backed plan that ropes, spins the fuel in the reactor and moves it around so we will use more of it while it's running. But that's three weeks from now. Uh, I'm running out of voice, energy, and you need to go to the bathroom too. <laughs> Don, thank you so much for your talk today. I'm sure we all enjoyed it. It was a little uh, complicated in some of the stuff that, that went on at that place. I'm glad I wasn't working there that night. But uh, at any rate, thank you so much for the talk, and we'll look forward to hearing about Midland next week.